right uh, so let's start the lecture so as you see uh, what i would uh, like to discuss today uh, it's uh, yeah, uh, email security uh, so most of you know uh, so people believe security can be achieved using kind of a firewall uh, then uh, using uh, using uh, uh, TLS, IPsec, uh, IDS, and IPS, and so and so. So what I personally feel that's kind of a might because firewalls, TLS, IDS, IPS, or IP security, all those. Uh, concentrate on the security of uh, the information while they are at work. So in addition to that, we need to think about security of so many other things. One of the major thing is email. Uh, ma major part of that is basically email. Uh, so that's the topic we concentrate. So at the end of this lecture, I want to give you a feeling we are heavily using email, but we don't uh, concentrate the security part of it. Why, why I say so, you know, in the life cycle of the information, uh, the, our information may enter into the three stages. What we call it as information address, information in transit, and information in use. So most of the uh, security products, as we discussed, IPsec, uh, IDS, firewalls, they protect our information in transit. So that means they protect our information when those information moves from one end to the other end. Uh, but our information usually entered into two other stages, what we call it as address and in use. What is address? Address means where are the information stored at the server, uh, server, and maybe information when stored at your computer. So basically, you know, most of the situations, those information in the plain text format. Uh, so for example, when you use email systems, you, uh, most of us use online email. Uh, so those information stored in the email service provider uh, server. So those servers, uh, obviously can accessible by the service provider, but uh, plus uh, those information, in case some bad guy get access to those servers, so people can get those information. So in, uh, you know that uh, protecting information address has uh, basically neglected. And the other stage where information basically, uh, we need to think about information in use. So I will discuss that in later stages. Uh, so basically we don't have a lot of tools or kind of methods, proper methods and uh, uh, techniques, protocols to protect uh, the information in use. We basically rely on the protection provided by operating systems and other uh, low level kind of uh, layers of the uh, uh, system like OS and then other layers. When, when we want to protect information in use. Uh, most of the protocols speak pro protect the information in transit. For example, uh, since most of us use online email system like Gmail and Yahoo, so, so those information protected using a protocol called TLS when it's in transit. Uh, so in the other stages, it's not protected. So especially when you use emails, email is very, very unsecure media of communication. So this is the kind of uh, uh, definition of the email where I really like. So this definition, as you might see, uh, this person uh, defined the email as a photo uh, postcard written in pencil. Why? So let's say you, you get a postcard uh, delivered by the post office or someone uh, to you. So obviously, this uh, postcard, there are no confidentiality at all. 
because uh, anyway, uh, the postman, when before they give that postcard to you, definitely they will read it and give it to you, so they can see the content. Not only the postman during the delivery, anyone can see the content of this uh, postcard. So obviously there are no confidential. Email is the same. So when some, you send the email, so from your machine, it delivered to the service provider. Obviously, maybe that link perhaps get encrypted, but the people who handling this email uh, basically can read that content. So as you may notice, uh, major email service providers like Gmail, Yahoo, they are reading your content. How can you notice that? Basically, you may understand the advertisements uh, usually show to you on those service providers uh, related to the your email content. For example, if you have an email which discusses about education, most of that is when you get it related to education. If you have some email in your mailbox inbox related to fashion, most of the uh, most of the advertisements you get from those service providers are related to fashion. So maybe you already noticed that. Not only that, intelligent agencies and other people uh, they are reading those content to get gathering the in intelligence of the people. So in the internet, uh, I mentioned at the several times, there are no service calls, no free service. Uh, either you have to pay by money or you have to pay by the data. Like Facebook email, how do you pay? You pay by your data. So basically those email providers are not interested to provide the confidentiality of your content because they want to read that. Like a postcard, so email can be visible to a different people while it delivered from your end to the other side. No confidential. Similarly, as you may understood, or you may already know, uh, anyone can write an email like anyone else. Uh, so there are only few considerations you have to do, so you have to do for that. So postcards are also the same, you know, like in the in the postcard, uh, you can write a from address, any address, right? So no no verification of the from address. So that means postcard can write as someone else. So similarly, email can write someone else. So what we're missing there is authentication. We are missing the authentication of this uh, communication because of uh, uh, in the postcard. Similarly, we have an issue of authentication in the email communication. Third one is obviously integrity. So I said the email is a postcard written in pencil. So if, if, if uh, we write a postcard using a pencil, so maybe a postman can erase that and write a different message on that. So it is possible. In the email also that possible. So you, someone can insert a content, delete a content, or replace your email content completely. It's something else. So, so there we are missing the integrity requirement. So as you may understood, a, a postcard written in pencil may not have any confidentiality, any integrity of the message and authentication. Same as email may not provide us uh, by default confidentiality, integrity and authentication. So that is very serious because we are using emails to do day-to-day -day application. Since these days, most of us working at home, we depend on the communication which we do over the email. We trust what we receive, but uh, we cannot by default because someone can write someone else, uh, someone can alter the content, uh, everybody see the content. So how can we trust them? As you may aware, in order to provide the security of email, uh, obviously to achieve the confidentiality, integrity, and uh, uh, authentication of the email system. Uh, so there are two standard protocols. So those protocols are called SMIME, and the other one is called PGP, pretty good privacy, PGP protocol, SMIME and PGP protocol. Uh, so these are the two protocols. Uh, using those two protocols, uh, uh, basically we could enhance our email systems to uh, achieve uh, integrity, authenticity, and confidentiality. Not only that, 
Uh, so if you use any of these, we, we achieve a very important security requirement, what we call it as non-repudiation. So what is non-repudiation? Uh, so I mentioned in my other lectures, as you may remember, non-repudiation refers to collecting legally valid evidence uh, during any kind of action, any kind of transaction. So basically, uh, if you use digital signatures, uh, we could achieve non-repudiation. The method of achieving non-repudiation is digitally signing the content, digital signatures. So these digital signatures uh, are legally valid evidence. Even in Sri Lanka, according to the electronic, uh, whatever electronic evidence has, uh, the digital signatures considered as a legally valid evidence. So if you, if someone puts a signature on the content, so for example, email, that considers as you are signing manually, like you are putting your manual signature. Uh, so unless otherwise we couldn't, uh, we couldn't kind of consider it as a legally authorized document. So if you want to consider email as a legally valid authorized document in order to take some decisions, that should be digitally signed. Unless otherwise you are using SMIME or PHP, you don't have this feature. Right, so in the first half of this lecture, I will uh, go thoroughly through those two protocols or the standards, what we call it as, two major standards, SMIME and PGP, and explain you how those two work. And then I will show you the practically how PGP, how we can uh, use PGP in our day-to-day -day application. Right, let's start our discussion with SMIME. So maybe you are aware of the major content uh, uh, standard, what we call it as multi-purpose internet mail extension, or what we call it as MIME. MIME extension is the major standard which defines the structure of the email message. So it has a header part. In the header part, as you may see here, it has a form address, two address, and the content type. Major uh, section is the content type. Using this content type, we can provide which kind of content it is. Like uh, we can say that is a uh, video, that is a multi-part content, and so on. Multi-part content makes us so multiple sections of the uh, document, or for our example, email. So those multiple content may have uh, another email content, another document, or it may have some other embedded object like uh, uh, a message or video and things like that. Basically, we are attaching uh, uh, videos and other attachments to the email using this uh, MIME format. So our uh, one part of it, uh, the uh, body is basically our text message, and then MIME defined another part uh, to insert the attachment like that. So when you use my content, we have may get different parts. In these different parts, we may have different content. So that is uh, how these MIME structures look like. So how the MIME kind of uh, identify those uh, uh, segments? They are identifying those segments, what we call it as labels or boundaries. So for example, this figure shows, so you see this boundary name, we can use any name there. So using this dash dash boundary name, they will clearly identify boundaries. So this is a one part of the message and this is the other part of the message. Like that we can have different parts in the same message. So that's how email gets structured. So using the MIME. So following this structure, there is a standard created called SMIME. So it refers to secure MIME, secure MIME standard or the SMIME. SMIME is the international standard of providing the protection of email. So SMIME defined the way how to encrypt the content, how do you digitally sign the content, and so on. Everything is properly structured. So those uh, data structures uh, define in a separate standard what we call it as public key cryptography standard number seven, PKCS standard, public key cryptography standard number seven define data structures of uh, uh, data structure of the object. So those data structures which uh, use 
uh, to kind of create digitally encrypted data plus digitally signed data. So what SMIME did, so they embed this PKCS7 object into the mine content using this multiple section. So by doing that, we are kind of created an international standard called SMIME, Secure Mine, to protecting email message. Unfortunately, no one uses it. I will discuss why it's so at the end. Right, let's uh, have a look on those data structures because they're important to have those uh, data structures, how these data structures look like. So first we have a look on the PKCS7, Public Cryptography Standard number seven, signed data structure. So the signed data structure uh, explains how to create a digitally signed content. So this, this part, content, and the content type is basically the, uh, our email, email message. So e, any content may be inserted there, like an attachment, word, document, PDF, whatever. This is our email, and this is our email. It says type of the message and then content. So it, it, it totally, it, this field called it as content information in this PKCL7 data structure. And obviously before that there is a version number field and then uh, there is a field called digest algorithm field. So these digest algorithms means actually hashing algorithms which we're going to use in this, uh, in, uh, during this data structure creation, right? So the major part of this data structure here is the content information that is our content. Now what we want to do using this data structure is to digitally sign this content. So, in order to create a digital signature, this standard defined the uh, data structure or the data field called signer information field. So this signer information field consists of several subfields, uh, several subfields. So those subfields are called as uh, version, and then uh, signer ID, then digest algorithm, authenticated attributes and digest encryption algorithm. And finally here in the down uh, is uh, signature, signature of the country. Uh, so the sign ID is basically the identification of the person who signs it. And then digest algorithm is kind of a, a hashing algorithm, a hashing algorithm where uh, basically, uh, which we use uh, to create the hash and authenticated attribute, it's kind of a time of signing and so on. And then digest encryption algorithm is basically uh, the public key cryptography algorithm, uh, public key cryptography algorithm, that is uh, RSA or whatever. So you know the signing is, uh, in the signing process, what we do is we create the hash and encrypt this hash using our private key. So this uh, digest encryption algorithm says uh, hashing a public key algorithm name. So for example, this hash digest algorithm may be uh, SHA-1 or MD5 or whatever. So digest encryption algorithm may, field may consist of uh, RSA or elliptic curve, ECC and such names. And finally, this is encrypted hash that is considered as a signal. All together that is put it into the signer information field. So after we put that into the signer information field, uh, we can include uh, public key certificates where we have a public key uh, uh, to uh, distribute, and we can insert what we call certificate revocation list. That means actually revoke, cancel public key certificates, uh, serial numbers also into this data structure but usually we are only in inserting uh, the certificate, uh, public key certificates, certificate where we used to sign this. And we are not going to insert uh, uh, certificate revocation list or the cancer certificates in this data structure. Right, by the way, I think some of you are facing our problems. So here in my uh, area, there was, uh, power background just happened. But uh, since I use my laptop and I'm using uh, power pack for my ADSL connection, fiber connection, basically still works. I think uh, people who are listening can get the video, right? 
Am I getting the feedback? Yes. Are you listening? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, right, right. So I think we can uh, continue until the power pack <laughs> go finish, but I think it, the power will come soon. Okay, I will continue the next day when the power, uh, power uh, failure is kind of happening in my area right now. Okay, uh, so then, so uh, then there are the other major data structure that we uh, uh, use in this uh, standard called public key cryptography number seven analog data structure. Uh, in this analog data structure, we define the way we can encrypt the message. Or we, uh, this process is called it as not encryption, it's called it as analoging. Why? Because we kind of combine uh, that with the symmetric key encryption. It's not, we are not directly use public key encryption to en encrypt the content, instead of we combine it with the symmetric key. So let's see how it happens. So in this PKCS analog data structure, there are two major fields, that is our encrypted content here, and then recipient information field here. So recipient information field, you see there are several subfields, version, recipient ID, key encryption algorithm, and encrypted key. What is this encrypted key? This encrypted key is the symmetric key. Uh, it may be AES or the DES key. So in this process, what happens, we generate the AES or the DES key. So that key will be encrypted to the recipient using recipient's public key. So obviously, in order to create this data structure, the sender might should have public key of the recipient. So sender should obtain the public key of the recipient first using that public key he should encrypt a session key and put it into this field. And he mentioned which algorithm he used to do so, that may be a public key cryptocurrency algorithm, whatever. And all together, that call it as a recipient information field. Uh, so that is put it into there. And then we have to en encrypt the content. No? So what we do, we get the content and we encrypt the content using this key. We encrypt the content using this key. And we put that here and mention which algorithm which we use to encrypt that content and this content type. And all together, we call it as encrypted content information. So if someone receives that, how do, how he can retrieve the messages, you, under, uh, you may understand. So how do you do that? So first of all, we have to see that we understand the content type and we see that field, we know this is an encryption algorithm, maybe AES or whatever, then he has to decrypt that content. In order to decrypt that content, we need to get the AES key. So in order to get the AES key, the, uh, the retrieving side has to go to the recipient information field and get this field and then decrypt it using the private key of the recipient. So after decrypt that using the private key of the recipient, he gets the key which used to encrypt this content. So using that key, he decrypt that content so and access to the message. So that is called it has PKCS 7 analog data structure. So as you may see, there are two data structures, PKCS 7 signed data structure and the analog data structure. If someone wants to digitally sign, we use uh, signed data structure. If someone want to encrypt, we use analog data structure. But practically, you may understood. So we want to do signing and encryption both to provide confidentiality, integrity, authenticity, and non-repetition of the messages. We need to do the both together. They are what we usually do. First, we do the signing data structure, uh, execute the signing process. And then we take that as the content of here and then we encrypt it, including the signature. So we create the signed data structure first, and then we say content type is signed data structure, and that content is encrypted using this format, uh, analog data structure. So we, with that, we create a signed and encrypted data bundle for the object. So that object is included or embedded into the MIME content and create what we call it as uh, S-MIME email message. So for example, if just we do the analog, S-MIME message may look like that. So it has the, define it as an analog data structure, and then it says this is the analog data. 
So as you may know, email is a, a text uh, protocol. So uh, whatever the data structures, we created uh, uh, the binary. So we need to convert those binary to a uh, text. So that uh, happens, or that uh, conversion created using uh, encoding algorithm. Uh, this is not encryption, encoding algorithm. So most of most popular encoding method is base64 encoding. So it says the encoding algorithm it uses here is base64. So, so he, someone want to access that. So basically, use base64 algorithm, decode it, and then they ended up with the PKCL7 analog data structure. So it says PKCL7 here. So analog data structure. Then people knows how to retrieve content from there. So they then they access that. So that's how we create uh, analog data. So as I said, in case someone want to use signatures, we are using a peak a sign a data structure. There we do something called clear sign data. Clear sign data means we create the signature part here and put it into one section and we put our message into the other section. Right? There are two sections of clear sign data structure of SMI message. One section contains the uh, clear message and the other section contains the signature part of it. So why we do so? Because in some uh, email clients may not support the SMI. So if that's so, still that email client can see the message. So that is important. So they cannot verify the signature, but they can see the message. So if you use this structure. If you don't use this uh, section, so if the SMIME is not supported at the recipient, then they may not see the content. So usually when you sign the message, you, you we use this data structure. Right. So as I mentioned, so we could use analog data structure to provide the confidentiality or you, we can use signed data structure to provide integrity uh, and uh, integrity uh, and non-repudiation and authentication requirements. And sometimes, as I mentioned, we are using clear signed data methods to include in the signature and the message in the separate section. So if you want to have confidentiality and uh, authenticity and interpretation all requirements we need to use a data structure called sign and analog data structure so that's what we use basically all right so what are the algorithms used in s9 so basically we have to use all public and symmetric algorithm plus hashing algorithms because we are using all cryptographic techniques we learn the hashing uh, public key uh, symmetric key and so on uh, so all the known algorithms, popular algorithms, uh, supported by these uh, standards. And uh, the negative side, one of the main negative side of this uh, standard is in order to use that, we must use public key certificates uh, issued by the certification authorities, or what we call it as CES. Certification authorities uh, uh, get it into the road. Uh, so if you want to, for example, if I want to use this, you need, I have to create public private keys and my, my public key need to certify it by the, one of the certification authorities in the world. All right. Or else in, within our organization, we have to uh, create our own certification server or our own CS server and that CS server should certify our public key according to the standard, what we call it as X509 public key cryptography uh, certificate standard. So since, as you know, we as end users using the online email system, we don't have such public key certificates, uh, end user public key certificates. So we are not be able to use this standard in our email system. Uh, so as I mentioned, either we have to get these certificates from certification authorities, authorities like VeriSign, or either you have, can run your own certification authority within your organization and certify your users. So that is, uh, it's kind of a, uh, not so easy to so many configurations, and there are con uh, complexity involved that, uh, because of that, even the standard is there, no one uses it. No one uses it. We are using an uh, online email system. So similarly, in case if you are using it, some of these uh, offline email system, uh, most of the offline email systems actually implemented this standard, SMIME standard. If 
to use uh, any offline email clients to uh, access your emails. So they have usually security tab here, and those security tab has uh, options provided to sign and encrypt the email content. But even though we are using offline data structures, we are not using that because we don't have public key certificate. We, we want to have public key certificate to use this. So since we don't have, we can't use it. In addition to that, as I mentioned, online email service providers like Google and Yahoo, they are not supporting it. So if they support it, people will encrypt the content, then they cannot read the content for their marketing purpose. Right. So then, uh, what is the other alternative standard? So as you may see, the SMIME is very, uh, a very kind of very powerful standard where which provide all the security we required, but we, uh, we practically we cannot use that due to those uh, limitations. So what what would be the alternative? Alternative is call it as PGP, pretty good privacy. PGP standards created uh, before the internet, actually somewhere in 80s, as I remember, and still people use it. This is kind of a community standard anyone can use. Uh, so maybe you can get together as a group and we, we can use it for our email communication. So it also provides all the my features. But the major advantage of PGP, it, it, it not, we don't require certification authorities when we are using PGP. Let's have a look how PG, what PGP provides and how the PGP message look like. So basically PGP provides the same security requirements as I mentioned, authentication, confidentiality, integrity, and things like that, because it has signing and encryption together. So as you may see, the SMIME, there are two different data structures we use to do signing and encryption. But in the PGP, we use a single data structure uh, to do that. So this single data structure is look like that. So uh, it has a data and then file type and timestamp. So this is basically our email message. And uh, this side, I define the operations we do with the PKC, uh, PGP. And this side says the content types of the message. Okay, so this is our message. So the first thing in the PGP, what we do is digitally sign this message. In order to digitally sign this message, we need to create the hash of the message and encrypt this hash. So this is what we call it as signing operation. So how do you do the signing operation? we get the hash of this message and encrypt this hash using the uh, public key cryptography algorithm that is using our private key. So it creates a digital signature, right? So then we put the time of signing and other identity information on the top. All together, this section is called it as a signature of the message. We have the message and here we have the signature of the message. And then we need to encrypt this message. So this operation is called as encryption. So we have to encrypt. Basically what we do, we create a, again, like SMIME, we cre create a session key that is a symmetric key. So using this symmetric key, we encrypt this message. Using the symmetric key, we encrypt. EK means encrypting with the symmetric key operation. So you see before that there is an operation I define is called as SIP. This is compression. Why do we need compression? So basically, as you may know already, the when you apply the cryptography, the message size get large. Hypertext size is usually larger than the plain text size. So we want to save the bandwidth and the space. So for that, we have to, what we do, we do compression before the encryption. So that is also important part. I also mentioned on the web security lecture, if you watch that video, you may notice that. So usually we do compression before the encryption. We are not doing the compression after the encryption. Why? After we do the encryption, our data is equally distributed, like distributed equally in the, uh, the data, data set, binary, binary distributed equal. So because of that, we cannot get good compression rate. If you want to get the compression, we must do the uh, compression first, and then compress data, we do the encryption. So other way around may not work. Uh, so actually it works, but it may not get good compression rate. So, so because of that, after we signing, 
what we do, we add the compression operation, zip or whatever, and then uh, compressed data will encrypt it using the session key. Right, now we have to pass that session key to our recipient. How do you do that? We encrypt that session key using the public key of the recipient. Obviously, in order to create that data, data structure, we must have the public key of the recipient beforehand. So we use in this public key, we encrypt that session key. And we put that encrypted session key into the header. That's called a session key component. So it's called, in, in this operation is encrypted with the public key. What we encrypt is the session key, right? So finally, at the end, we need to do the encoding to convert this entire data structure to the uh, uh, digital format, sorry, uh, uh, test format, and then we send to the recipient. So then what are the operations recipients need to do to access that message? So first of all, when this uh, recipient receive the PGP message, they have to decode it, and they will end up with this data structure. So then using this data structure, they have to decrypt that. In order to decrypt that, they need to get the session key. So in order to get the session key, get the recipient go to the session key component of the message and decrypt the session key using his private key. So then he obtained the session key. So using that session key, he decrypt the content. So after decrypt the content, he has to unzip that, decompress it, and he ended up with the signature part and the message part. So then he has to verify the signature. So in order to verify the signature, he has to calculate a hash of this data again, and then decrypt this signature or the hash using his using the public key of the recipe. So after decrypt that with the public key of the recipient, he should get the same hash of the message. So if both hash are equal, so signature is verified, so we could accept it as a valid message. So that's how do we verify uh, uh, obtain or kind of uh, re retrieve this uh, PGP sign and encrypted message. So as you may understood, in the PGP that happens in one single data structure. So in the PGP I mentioned, we are not using any kind of uh, uh, public key. So we, as end user, we manage our public keys ourselves, public private keys. So usually in the PGP clients, we have two types of keys in two, what we call two key rings. So one is our private keys, private key rings, other is our public key ring. So the public key ring consists of public key of our friends or the recipients, right? How do you obtain those public keys? It's up to us. So we could use some other uh, methods of obtaining that. Maybe we can ask them to email it or beforehand, or maybe we can exchange it using a key server, or maybe we can exchange it using a USB drive or whatever method. In trusted method, we need to ex exchange the public keys. So after we exchange those public keys, we, we, we all have the public keys uh, of our recipients, so then, those public keys we can then use uh, for encrypting the message. Uh, so that's how uh, we uh, uh, obtain the public key. So this PGP public key distribution is entirely personal. That means you, you do yourself, right? There are no CAs. We don't need any certification authority. We can do it ourselves. You can do it our own public keys exchange and then after that we can use those for encrypt decrypt uh, uh, pgp messages in between so that's why the pgp systems are more pop much more popular between the people among people right so the method we use to distribute the public key in the pgp system we call it as web of trust because uh, it's, it's kind of a web kind of data structure so uh, this is you, you have obtained maybe public key of the different people. So we can, we can consider those public keys as trusted public keys. And then those friends might have the uh, public keys trusted by themselves. And some PHP clients provide the features to obtain those public keys uh, from your friends as well. So then if you trust your friend, 
the public is trusted by your friend, become trusted by yourself as well. So I like that PGP provides self, kind of self-structured uh, public key distribution method in the PGP system. Uh, there are no certification authority needs, so we don't need to pay anyone, we don't need to, uh, to obtain those public keys. Right, so, so as you see at this point now, we have two standards to enhance the security of email, that is SMIME, and the other one is PGP. So in the SMIME, it's kind of complicated and then costly, uh, uh, so it, it, we have to use offline email clients mainly to use SMIME, but in the PGP, it's more flexible, so we can use for our day-to-day -day tasks. So let's now see how do you use PGP in practice. So if you want to use PGP in practice, practice we can use standalone email clients as well. Uh, but uh, fortunately, there are some well kind of uh, well established uh, plugins available from browsers. So using those plugins, uh, we can enhance existing uh, online email system with the PGP. That is very 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 important and very useful. So, for example, even in now, 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 these days, you know, everybody work at home, everybody heavily depend on email communication. So, as you understood now, emails are postcard written in pencil, can be worked on the messages written on the postcard, uh, because those are very unreliable. So, if you want to do action, or if you want to take decisions, you need to get email in very secure, reliable form. Otherwise, so when you continue working using unreliable or unsecure email systems, people might find methods of kind of uh, taking you to the trouble, right? So someone else can write someone else and you might take a decision based on that bogus mail, fake mail, and then you are in trouble. So when you receive emails, you should make sure you receive that from correct person. You have to make sure you receive the email with correct context. So, so the people know to you uh, send fake mails. People know how to kind of alter the content. Then, how do you rely on that? So, if you want to rely on the email, so you must use SMIME or PGP. So, SMIME is using a complete uh, complex. So, we uh, because of that, I will show how to use it. PGP. Okay, uh, so maybe, uh, so if you have any uh, questions or whatever, I will, would like to take it there uh, before I move to the practical session where I show you how to use PGP. Any questions someone want to ask? So you can unmute your mic and then ask questions or type it if you have any questions. Any questions so far? Are you still people are following me or I, I want to get a kind of like feedback from the audience, otherwise I don't know uh, whether you are following me or anybody can speak? We are following you, sir. Right, uh, you understood so far, no questions, right? So far all good. Okay, right, right. Then let's move on to the practical session. Uh, so fortunately, power problem is also solved. So I have power now. Uh, so we can continue uh, the session without any interruption. Right. Uh, so in this, uh, the next next uh, few uh, minutes, what I would like to uh, show you how to use PGP uh, with popular email system like Gmail and Yahoo. Uh, so fortunately, uh, we have some plugins to do so. I will show you how we do that uh, uh, practically. So maybe since you all in front of a computer, perhaps uh, you can follow me. If not, you can follow a drone. Uh, right, so let me share my desktop uh, so I can uh, do that demo, uh, live demo, right? Uh, so I share the desktop. So. Uh, I need the feedback. Uh, have you get my desktop? Before? Yeah. Right. Correct. Good. Right. 
so now I am showing uh, you how to uh, use uh, uh, PGP. So in order to use PGP, uh, basically I am using a plugin available for those uh, systems, uh, what we call it as, uh, basically what we call it as uh, uh, mail analog. So maybe some of you heard about this plugin, if not, so this is the plugin, mail analog. Uh, so I will, uh, the website uh, uh, is this, mail analog. Uh, this is the website, mailanalog.com. So maybe you can visit this website, same time if you are on in front of a computer, uh, and you can install this plugin to your browser, whatever the browser. More, uh, they support most of the browsers. So I have installed this plugin into my two browsers. One is uh, my uh, Chrome, you see Chrome browser. Uh, plugin uh, and then I use uh, maybe my Firefox browser uh, to simulate that. Uh, I have installed that plugin into my Firefox browser as well. Uh, so there are uh, a plugin available for other browsers, you can check that. So I, my uh, Firefox browser also I have this plugin. So I, in order to demonstrate that I use two accounts. So so one of the account I am going to use is my Yahoo account. Uh, sorry, I'm going to log in. I didn't log into Yahoo for a while. I quite forgot the password. Okay, that's good. Done. So this is uh, Yahoo account uh, where I want to demonstrate that, and then I use my regular Gmail account, right? So both browsers, uh, I uh, install this mail analog plugin. This is a PGP plugin, uh, mail analog plugin, right? So this is I didn't configure yet. Uh, so this one, I have already configured the plugin, right? Uh, so after we install the plugin, first thing is we have to do is we have to create the keys. Key, create the keys. So we go there and say let's start, and then it will uh, give you a, a page. We can generate public-private keys for ourselves. So we have to type our name. I use different name here. Uh, like that, and here we have to use the correct email address. Where are we going to use that? My, I use Yahoo email address here, right? And so this is my Yahoo email address, my name, and there are advanced features where we can uh, configure which algorithms to use: elliptic curve uh, or RSA. Uh, so you see, it's elliptic curve, curve 25, 590. That is. Uh, use that's still under elliptical experiment. So uh, maybe we use RSA and then we can define key size. So the recommended now 4096 by this mail analog size. Okay, so you don't need to change that. That default is there. I just show you that. And then you give your name, your correct email address, and you need to give a password to uh, passphrase to protect the key. Right? And you must remember this passphrase. Right. So then there is a tip. You are using that. You can upload your uh, public key to the key distribution server uh, host by the mail analog uh, guys. So that is called PGP uh, key distribution servers. There are plus minus of uploading. It. So if you upload it to such PGP online servers. So then other people can search your public keys on those servers and download that automatically and use that key. That is the plus point. The minus point is uh, some uh, email bots, uh, you know, the spamming systems. Email bots uh, usually search such online PGP servers to obtain your email 
addresses because with the public key, your email address will display on those PGP server in the public space. So then the email both might take that. So I prefer not to uh, upload my public key. So if I, so since the PGP is normally configured in the closed group, call like your organization within your organization or within your friends and so on. So there we don't need any third party servers. We can face to face meet or we can use our own servers to kind of distribute those public keys. Right, so because of that, usually I untick while generating the keys. Right, so then I say generate keys. Uh, so it will generate RSA public private key pay, pair for this email client and obviously for the, this browser. So it's key generation process in progress, done. So you see, I have created key, public private key for my Yahoo account. Right, so after you generate keys, there are two actions you must do. So the first one is basically you have to export your public key. Right, when you go to the export button, so I will show you when you press this export button, uh, there are three options. You can export your public key, you can export your private key and you can export public private key together. So I recommend you to do two things. One, export all. So you press export all and export your public private key together to a uh, backup purpose. So for example, let's say you reinstall your machine. So then you need to have same key pair. Uh, otherwise you may not be able to read all encrypted mail, right? So because of that, you have to save save your key pair. So you export your keys uh, and save it somewhere uh, like that. And then uh, you can kind of uh, uh, use that as uh, you use this for backup purpose. And don't distribute that file to anyone because that can contain your private key. So you kind of take that private keys to write it to the USB or write into the DVD or whatever, you keep it in the offline mode, right? So only for backup purpose, right? After that, what you have to do is you have to export your public key. So why do you export your public key? So you have to export it to send it to the other people. Otherwise, other people may not know about your public key. You can save it somewhere. Uh, so maybe I save it uh, to, Let's say I save it to my desktop here. So yeah, this is uh, so this is open now. So I actually I want to say saves and the download I think here yeah, it saves. So all keys are there and the public key is there. Right, so we export the public key. Right, so now uh, basically, uh, uh, so we, we are done with this key management. So then there are key management, this key, there is one key. Right, so then we have to send the uh, sign, uh, uh, kind of sign an encrypted message to our recipient. How do you do so? So we go to this compost in the normal Yahoo here. So I will write to this cousin, the uh, soiza at uh, gmail.com message, uh, text message, right? And then there is a button here, uh, this uh, mail analog button. So you can write the text here and press the button or you can press the button and write the message there. So either you have to do that way, right? So you, uh, do like that. And then you have options what to do. Uh, so you see it's, when you press that it says message has not signed. So if you want to digitally sign that you can do so because you have the keys now. So you private keys now you pick your key here you just generated. Now right. Uh, uh, so you can change the settings here as well. So anyway now you, you, you digitally sign and then you encrypt to custom this either. So so as you may see, so this mail analog client uh, uh, put it that as green because uh, somehow they know it's my public key. 
because I already created my public private key pair for my Gmail account. Okay, I think they will, because of that, they will automatically decrypt that, uh, encrypt that. Right, so then it asks the password which we have given while generating the private key. They yeah, have given that now, uh, it's now uh, in obtaining my public key and encrypt the data. So you see, uh, and uh, basically, this is the PGP message. Right, uh, it base it should go to the other side. Let's see whether they have sent that. Oh, maybe I have to send it here. So, okay, nice to send button. But, yeah, I send it. Right, so what's the uh, uh, kind of a uh, Plugin do they create the PGP message and send to the uh, put to the box uh, compose box so I can send that to this site. So you see in the, my Gmail account I receive that uh, right. So this is PGP message. So PGP plugin will automatically detect that is a PGP message. So I then uh, click on that uh, to access that. So then I have to give the password of my Gmail uh, private key to access that. So I say okay. So it will decrypt and show the message. You see this message. So that is a pop-up uh, created by the mail analog plugin. This is so you can close that here yeah, if you wish. So there in the down you can see the PGP message created by mail analog plugin. So that is sign, encrypted, and encoded test, right? So this test cannot access by anyone. Even uh, Gmail may not see that. Uh, even Gmail may not see that. Uh, and no one can access that. It, it, even at the beginning, no one can access that. If someone wants to access that content, he should access the private key uh, of me, which is actually stored in the browser. Obviously, if someone get access to uh, my browser, uh, they will access that content. So for example, this is my private key. So, sorry, this is my uh, private key. Uh, so this is the private key of this, right? So, uh, so if someone want to read that, so they have to access my private key stored on the browser. Otherwise, they can. Right? So, so this is message is not visible. So, if you want to uh, uh, visible that, it should go through this uh, plugin. So then that will decrypt and show. Right? So similarly, I can write to uh, the other people encrypted message like that. But as you see, I'm trying to write the Kasun DR account. It shows red. That means uh, I don't have in the Gmail side, I don't have the public key of Yahoo. So, but Yahoo got my public key automatically uh, of my Gmail because I have already pushed that public key to the uh, mail analog server. So from that they have fetched that. So, so I said that I'm not recommended to do so, then somehow if I don't do that, I must have public key here. Uh, so for that, uh, so what you have to, what you can do is, you can maybe email or you can manually exchange. For example, you can send a separate mail to me with the uh, public key. Uh, so then verify that it's actually my public key using offline method. So I think the public keys are somewhere I don't know. Uh, yes, this is the public key, I guess, uh, for Yahoo account. So I can send that to my other, my friends, right? So they will receive my public key. Uh, so then they can install this public key uh, into the system uh, like that. Uh, so this is the public key. Uh, so I can install that. 
So when you click that public key, mail error plugin will realize that is a public key. I click that and import into the plugin. Right, I confirm that. So then I get this public key here into the plugin. So then I have a private key of my, public key and private key of mine and public key of my recipient. Similarly, I have to get all public keys of recipient here. So after that, I can write to them. Uh, so I can write to them. Uh, so I say, So you see here, it's now green, uh, public key is ready. I, then I say, check whether I ask it sign with my private key, right? And then I encrypt and sign. Uh, so it encrypts, sign, and uh, sends to the recipe. Right, yes, and it goes to the other side. So see here. Edit here. Right, so I send no, so let's see. I send book. So this is the message I send. Yeah, call, right? Uh, so it should receive by this. Hmm. Or if maybe it's put the spam folder. Oh. Oh. Should get it. I uh, maybe some. Yeah, we will send it back. Uh, forward. Uh, so it should get it here. Anyway, so it, it will get it, right? Uh, so you see, I send the other side, and this side it should work, uh, right? Uh, so that's uh, how you can do that. And uh, in the last year, you might notice uh, uh, the Gmail has introduced some interesting features. I would like to discuss that. I am using, uh, I am writing a message to maybe my other uh, Gmail account like that. Uh, this feature, Gmail called it as confidentiality uh, uh, feature of the Gmail system. So this is an interesting feature, but let's see what it is. So I write a message here to my some, my UCS account, and maybe notice this uh, a button here on the down of the email compost. So that is called it as uh, confidentiality. So Gmail confuses the entire world by introducing that. So the people may feel that is uh, provide the confidentiality of the content. It's not so. What it is. So using that confidentiality button, you can do and some security, but it's not really proper security. But maybe some security. For example, you can write using this confidentiality button, you can write an email which automatically expires. So plus this email may not for cannot forward to anyone and cannot print and things like that. So you have full control of the email. So for example, after you send the email to a recipient X. So recipient can do anything for that email. He can save it, print it, forward to some other people, and so on. You don't have any control out of that email. With this confidentiality mode, the email gives some control to the you. So if I ask, for example, after you write a confidentiality email, you can define how long this email is visible in the recipient's hold. Maybe one week, one month, or five years. It's by default, it's five years. So maybe say one one day. So that means that tomorrow this email disappears in his uh, inbox automatically. 
and then you can assign a passcode to that email. So for example, without knowing the passcode, recipient may not be able to access that. That passcode can distribute using email or using phones. So unfortunately, SMS feature is not provided to Sri Lanka yet. So because of that, uh, you have to use email to distribute your passcode. So your recipient, maybe the Gmail client or maybe any, any other mail client. So if you write a confidential mail to other email clients, they only get a link to access that mail. So in order to access that link, they have to give the defined password. Password is defined by Gmail, not by you. So obviously that shows Gmail can read that content, right? Gmail still has the control and then intermediate people can read that. They are not doing any encryption. They just not copying that mail to the recipient's mailbox. Instead, they keep that mail only in the sender, sender data storage or the sender mailbox and you will link to the recipients to access that, right? So if you delete that mail, confidential mail from your sandbox, so that will automatically delete. That means re your recipients may not be able to access that anymore, right? Yeah, obviously, it gives some control to you. So if you don't see, you don't need to, give, to show that anymore to the people, you can delete that. At the time, they have kind of take a screenshot or something like that, so there are no help, so then they can kind of keep it. Unless otherwise you have some control of that using this confidentiality mode. Like that, you can send the mail, confidential mail to any recipient. So then this is my other mail, that confidentiality mail may receive to that. Obviously here in this email has some delays, I guess. Let's see my Yahoo mail delivered. Now after my Yahoo mail now comes. Uh, so so you see this is uh, Sign an uh, encrypted mail. Uh, I send from my Gmail to Yahoo. So when I click that, so I can see the content. So both sides work. Since everybody work at home, I think there are some delays on the systems now. Uh, from the, okay. So this is uh, confidentiality mail uh, reached to my UCSC mailbox. So you see, uh, it says confidentiality content expires on that. Day. So uh, let's write a confidentiality mail to my Yahoo, a different service provider, uh, to see whether what happened. Uh, and say confidentiality expires in one week. Uh, and save and send. That will receive to the Yahoo. Uh, so maybe this receive to my other mailbox now. Uh, you see a mail box, it should appear now. The mail I sent before. So you see, it's received here. Uh, so then, uh, okay, my Yahoo received, uh, yes, you see Yahoo received confidentiality mail. So when I want to, no, this is not the one. This is my still they are delayed. Uh, so this is one. This is confidentiality mail. So you see, it's a says it's a confidentiality mail. If you want to view that, you press this link. So then it sends the passcode to your phone or the mail. So so then you have to go back. So you might. Receive another mail from Gmail, which is the passcode uh, to access that mail. So uh, here my UCSC account. So with the if you write within the Gmail system, it may not have any passcode. It shows that, but you see it here. You can reply. Uh, you cannot. Uh, yeah. So here, confidentiality mail. Should not allow it. So 
So you see, it's basically it's not allowed printing. It shows this is a confidential agreement. So you see, message was sent. Confidential agreement. Uh, so it's, you need to get a password from the Gmail service provider to do the printing and so on. So, so, so this is just uh, 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 something kind of introduced by Google, uh, uh, which are uh, not really the real security of securing the email content it shows that is kind of uh, it's a illusion which kind of uh, shows the people uh, gmail provide the confidentiality of your content it's really not so so then it sends the passcode and kind of like you have to type the passcode to access it and so on so so it's kind of like so you can try it out anyway right what i want to tell you here so Gmail has introduced some new button called confidentiality. It's really not confidentiality. It, it kind of uh, gives you a feeling, comfortable feeling about their users, like they provide the content address. Actually not. Uh, so they just so do as, this, as it is, but instead of they are putting that mail to the recipient content box, now they are keeping the mail on the sender box and giving the link. Uh, to load it, so then sender has control of the mail, full control of the mail. So that uh, the story about confidence. If you want to get real confidentiality, uh, integrity, and authenticity of the email system, you must use uh, you must use uh, PGP. You must use PGP. Now you know how to use PGP, obviously. Now, right. Uh, so we are here, right. So we finish that demonstration uh, part. Of, uh, any questions so far? Are you following me still, the people? Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, this is confidentiality. And by the way, there is other mail system called Proto Pro, Proto Mail. Maybe you heard about it. So they say they give all the features and so on, but they are very costly. So it's not practical to use. What you should do is you, you can still use email with PGP feature if you require the security. Right. So, uh, so this demo I did. Right. Next section. So in the next section, what I would like to discuss the other security issues with email. So mainly, you know, when you use emails, it's spam is the problem. Right. We, we are getting unwanted emails. So all kind of unwanted emails, we call it as spam. So, so usually, you know, over 90% of the email content or email delivery spams, uh, over 90. So what kind of spams we can see? We can see different kinds of spam. Most of the spams are advertisement. And then we see charity appeals. Then we see financial scams, we call it as Nigerian uh, uh, scams, uh, and then chain letters, uh, phishing items, and maybe malware and viruses uh, spread via spam. Right. So advertisement, as everybody knows, advertisement companies are collecting huge collection of email addresses of us, and they keep, uh, keep pushing advertisements to our uh, email box. And then uh, when you discuss about charity appeals and chain letters, you know you are getting mail saying uh, so some story and say at the end it says if you forward that story to the seven people, God bless. So then what usually people do is the mail asks to forward to seven, but they are forwarding it to maybe hundreds or all mail all inbox of them. So by doing that, they put yourself as the rest of the people on trouble. So I will discuss how. So then uh, the financial scams, you know, the different people uh, uh, send you the financial scam saying, uh, so you won a lottery and maybe you won a kind of a Volvo or Benz car and things like that. So some people get trapped to this uh, bogus mail. And then if you follow such financial scams, uh, so you might realize they ended up with two, usually two ends. In the one side, they might say, we are about to kind of uh, uh, post your parcel or the jet, and you need to get insurance of that. And then they will give a link to take the insurance. 
so then you can follow that link and get your insurance maybe insurance may uh, worth five dollars or kind of like ten dollars maximum so so that's it you may not get the parcel so those insurance companies are bogus companies which collect the money from the people on the other hand sometimes uh, the financial scams you might get uh, uh, from these uh, uh, presidents of Africa or whatever, or different countries and saying they like to do any business, uh, uh, join ventures and so on. And if you follow such finally, they might say, you may, they may not be able to directly transfer uh, uh, money from their account to your account instead of you have to open an uh, account in online bank uh, 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 in a bank in a different country and you uh, need to open an account online. So since you are looking for this billions, you might go there and open an account. So there is a small account opening fee, maybe ten dollars. So after you open the account, you may never receive the money. That's it. So those online banks are fake banks, right? So because of that, don't waste your time on this uh, financial scam. So most of those financial scams um, managed or conducted by Nigerian people. So because of that, we usually call them as Nigerian scams. Right. So then the next question we may uh, have in our mind, how do they get our email address? How those email uh, kind of people get, collect our email address? So most of the time they collect email address from email harvesting programs or what we call as email board. So there are, I will show you one of them. And then using that we can collect those. So usually people post their email address on the different forums and mailing lists and so on so they keep them public on the website so then from those websites uh, the harvesters collect those email addresses so then you might ask a question so how do i publish my email to the other people uh, so so the, i recommend you to publish your email if you don't want to do so using the email not using a text file. So if you publish it using it as a text, so harvesting programs will automatically retrieve that. If you publish it as an image, then they cannot detect it, it as an image. So sometimes not only you, maybe someone else take on your email and they might publish that. The other thing is if you want to get any 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 service from the web, so you have to kind of uh, you have to give your email address. So those web-based service providers, servers, collect your email address day to day. So those service providers might sell your email address to those spamming companies. All your email address has a marketing value. So because of that, uh, so after uh, collecting those email addresses, some companies without informing you might sell that. Like that, there are several methods spammers might collect uh, the email address. So if you want to kind of check or if you want to retrieve email addresses from the web and see whether your email is exposed to the web, uh, you can use a simple tool called the Harvester. Some of you may know about this tool. I will show that using this Harvester tool. Uh, Harvester tool basically you can uh, you, you can uh, you can basically uh, uh, let me uh, you can basically uh, uh, retrieve email addresses. Let let me show that uh, how was the tool I have already installed. Uh, so you can install that. Uh, so if you want to see whether uh, uh, whether your email address is uh, publish. Uh, you can run that. Uh, so maybe I will run the harvester tool uh, and show you how to do that. So the program called harvester, uh, using minus D option, you can uh, search the domain you want to search. I say I want to search PNBACLK domain, uh, university domain, and using minus L, I can tell the harvester program uh, the search queries you want to run, how many search queries you want to execute on top of the popular search engine. 
So it may be Google, Yahoo, and so on. Uh, so I'm only search uh, the UCSC emails which can be retrieved from Google with first 500 search queries. So that's which this command tells. So then the Harvester tools will inject search queries to Google automatically and collect all the content pages and then uh, uh, filter those content pages to get email address and the IP addresses of the web servers which is displayed on those content. And uh, like that people can use. For example, uh, right now on the web, uh, so those email addresses kind of uh, dispose on the first 500 uh, queries and those uh, servers IP addresses are kind of disposed. Uh, so maybe I can, uh, if I further customize and say, uh, see what are the UCSC uh, content get disposed over there. And anyway, they are some, some of these content are public content. So we don't need to worry about some of these may not public. Uh, so that's the issue. Some of the should not public, but uh, uh, without our knowledge, they got pub published uh, over the web, and then the search engine has indexed them, indexed them, and then basically we retrieve. So, for example, so those emails, UCS emails, uh, basically visible, uh, somehow published. Even my mail is there. I didn't publish it, so somewhere it's published. Some other mail is there, and like. Uh, uh, some of these mails, perhaps, uh, obviously, it's the public, like if the mail, it should be public. But uh, so some of the mails, we are not purposely published that, but they are publicly available on the uh, searching. Uh, so those like uh, servers also, they search over there. There is a server, I don't know about it, this server, but somehow this domain is public, uh, according to in the UCS, like that. So there are tools, online tools available. So those are called harvesting programs. So that's using such tools, basically the spammers collect cover email address. So because of that, you have to be careful. So after collecting this, those email addresses, most dangerous action some bad guys do is phishing. Phishing, maybe you know about the phishing. Phishing is basically collecting uh, credentials over the internet. So when you want to, collect fish over the rivers, we call it fishing. When you collect confidential things over the internet, we call it as fishing. Right. So fishing, what we collect, maybe passwords, usernames, uh, birthdays, or any confidential data. So the fishers can use different techniques to collect those. What are those techniques? So, so those techniques call it as the link manipulation, spoof website, website surgery, filter evasions, and so on. Among them, the link manipulation and spoof websites are much popular. And anyone can run those websites uh, or run those techniques in very easily using different tools. I will show you one of those tools in a minute. So, so one of these tools, most of the tools, what they do, the spammers or the fishers, what they do, they create what we call it as look like website. So using this look like website, uh, they, when you enter some details, they basically record those details. And then they forward you to the real website. Uh, so especially usernames and the password. Uh, so I will show some and explain how they do that. So this is some phishing mails. Uh, uh, like that, let, let me show you the, how, how a simply phishing works using some uh, phishing testing tool called GoFish. So some organization use such tool, phishing test tools to, uh, to educate uh, the end users within the organization because some end users are not aware of uh, non-technical users, especially not aware of those phishing techniques. And when the fishers hit with those phishing mails to the organizations, uh, the people who are not educated on this may give their usernames and password and put entire organization on risk. So because of that, uh, some organization run such uh, phishing frameworks or phishing text and then educate people on that. Uh, some of the tools which we can use for such a phishing test is a tool called GoFish. 
So let let me show how this fishing works using GoFish uh, now. So for that, I have installed this tool in my computer, uh, and uh, I I have that tool running here. I run that. Uh, actually, I am running that locally to demonstrate using the local computer. But uh, uh, if you want to do like phishing test practically, you have to get a public instance of a web server and you have to obtain some misleading domain name and run that in a public server. You have to run this GoFish framework in a public server. I am demonstrating in, in the local. Now my GoFish is running. Uh, so then I need to go to this uh, GoFish admin uh, page uh, uh, to start this uh, phishing campaign. So this is actually now I got this passcode to access my confidential mail on Yahoo. So anyway, uh, we, we understood that. Uh, so uh, so I need to log in uh, to uh, go fish admin. Uh, so then I can run a phishing campaign. So I have created some campaign and already run that uh, to demonstrate. So for example, uh, so I have run a, com a campaign called Comfort Bank. So, so using that, I have actually sent a phishing mail to myself. So I think it is still in my mailbox, and I will let's see whether it's work. Uh, so when I go to my inbox, I have So I created some Bogus account to do that. Uh, so you see here there is a mail, uh, which this is phishing mail. It says uh, your password has expired. You need to click here to uh, set the password of some part mail. When you press that, so you see I get uh, some part which uh, login page. So you see, it look, this, this page is called look like website. So it's, uh, uh, visually, it looks like the Sampad bank. It's really not Sampad bank. You can notice that it's from my local machine. But if the officials run it in a uh, uh, public server, they usually obtain maybe Sampad bank dot info, Sampad bank dot maybe uh, dot uh, EU or whatever other domain name. Even when you look at the domain name, it looks like domain name. So the people may not realize this is fishing. So then, Without realize this is the phishing mail, and without realizing you are not in the real website, you might enter uh, your password in this uh, page, and they then press the sign in button. So when you press the sign in button, you might see uh, I automatically go to the Sampad Bank website, right? So then you may see I'm not logged in. And you might think you mistype your password and you will really type your correct password and you log in, right, to the real website. But uh, so after you press that phishing website, you, the phishing website automatically forwards you to the real website after recording your username and password. So that is then. So this, this is then Fisher who and that may have such a, a websites under his control. So then he can see like, for example, uh, so uh, he can see the view result of this campaign. So he might receive, you see, uh, information from me. I started campaign and so on, so I can view the details. So you see uh, the username, password they have recorded. So if I send that phishing mail to maybe a thousand people, I can get thousand username and password if they get through. So how people write that phishing campaign is very simple. Like first of all you need to create a target victim. So you you can add the victims, like I have only one victim that is myself, right? 
uh, and then uh, you have to create email templates. So using the templates, you can create a bogus email message to fake mail message. So then people get uh, this is clear. Like so, in the sample bank, I have created the message saying like that here in this HTML form, which look like this kind of thing like that. And then uh, we need to create uh, what we call it as landing page. In the landing page, where you create a look like website. So, uh, for example, uh, here, maybe I believe that if I created uh, previously, if you want to create uh, a landing page like Facebook, so you don't need to do a lot of things. What you say, import, and say, I want to have uh, a look like landing page, and say, import. Uh, uh, then we have to say sorry HTTPS. Uh, they automatically fetch the Facebook pages uh, uh, and then kind of create a first look like website, and then they they automatically host that like here, right? So that's what I did using this. Uh, Compass bank. Uh, so you see, I created the landing page like that, importing this first page of the bank. Uh, so you see, it's very simple to create such. And then we need to create a sending profile that we need any SMTP server, mail sending server. So I use Google to do that. I create an account on Google, Google's account, and uh, use that. And I'm sending fans over the Google. Uh, so uh, then, uh, so then basically, uh, after that, uh, I have to start a campaign. Uh, so in the campaign page, I can say new campaign and say, give some name like that, and then select which templates to use. Uh, so this template of email, if I say this template to use, and then URL. So this is the landing page URL. So kind of web server URL, that should be a public URL. So even though I use local URL for uh, demonstrating it. And then I give a schedule, where I should, when should I start? And then I need to send the SMTP server or the mail server to send that. And then uh, select the groups I, I want to send it and then launch the campaign. The tool will automatically shoot the spamming mails or phishing mails to the end users, kind of victims. So those victims get phishing mails, and then they click those links, and they landed with look like website, and enter their confidential data, that's usernames and the password, and then Fisher collect those, and then you are in trouble. So because of that, you want to be very careful. What you should not do is clicking the links on the mail. So that is the most important thing. When we discuss about email security, the, this is very important. The links on the emails are really dangerous. So on the top, they might have something, and then the, behind the URL is something else. So, and if you click the links on the mails, you may go to uh, look like websites. And those, using those look like websites, features will collect your emails and the passwords, especially passwords. So then they will access to those, accounts and then you, you they may blackmail you and so on. So when discussing on the email security, so the phishing is really a problem, really a problem where we have to educate the end user. Uh, so before entering any username and the password uh, to those sites, you should be very, very careful. All right, so then, Attachment with the emails, so you know we do a lot of attachment. We attach the content. So, so when you attach the content as attachment to the email, so there we have to be careful. Those attachments may not contain virus or the malware. So, with those, then uh, uh, malware can get spread. So, fortunately, online email system now have online e uh, virus scanners. So that reduces the risk of the attachment. So when you send the email with attachments now, usually online email service providers, they will automatically scan the content. And if there are viruses, they will let you know. So they may 
not allow you to download attachment with virus nowadays. Because of that, uh, most of these uh, attachment issues get solved. But if there is a new virus which you don't know about yet, can still spread. Because those yeah, virus scanners which uh, installed on those service providers may also know, don't know about this uh, virus. So then you can get uh, those new virus infected with that attachment. Because of that, it's general rule when you are using email is don't open attachment. Don't open attachment. So how do you uh, identify such? Usually, if you get uh, unexpected attachments, you should know this is maybe consists of a virus and we have to not, we should not open that. And uh, so sometimes we say you write two stage mail to get uh, spread attachment. So for example, if you really want to send attachment to someone, you write a mail without attachment saying, I am going to send attachment with this mail, uh, with this file and so on, and then write a second mail with the content of attachment. So then the recipient expecting attachment from you, then recipient can open that. Otherwise, recipient have uh, get unexpected attachment. Usually, unexpected attachment consists of uh, malware. So you have to be careful on that. Uh, then uh, we need to discuss how do you stop spam because uh, phishing or the attachment malware spreads happens with the spam then how do you stop spam? So stop spam is kind of a very, very complicated, difficult thing. All the online mail providers are battling with this issue and they come, to some extent they get suspended, but still they cannot provide proper solution for that. There are different techniques we use from history to right now. The most of the historical method we use to stop spam is blacklisting and whitelisting. Blacklist means actually we have email address of spammers and we stop uh, receiving mails from these blacklisted mails. That is never work nowadays because spammers are regularly change their address, from address. So because of that, so if you start blacklisting, you may end up with millions of blacklist uh, email address, millions of uh, blacklisted millions of email address. So that's not practical. And on the other hand, whitelist is practical, but uh, even though whitelist is practical, uh, sometimes it has issues. So what is whitelist? Whitelist means we are maintaining a list of email addresses and we only receive emails from that email address. Obviously that is spam proof, but the problem is if new users want to reach you, new uh, guests want to kind of reach you, they cannot reach you because their email address not in your whitelist. So for that, some people introduce some techniques. So for example, some systems, what they do, they have two stage uh, techniques. So if a new guest email, like new person, uh, send you an email, which is not in your whitelist, the system will automatically generate the email and sends it back, saying, uh, you are covering with this whitelisting software. If uh, you, if the recipients, kind of, if the sender really want to reach uh, you, uh, rewrite this email with some code. So most of the time, spammers use tools. If that email get bounced, tools just skip that. If uh, since that uh, whitelist spam get bounced, uh, so the whatever the sender, if they really need to reach you back they might write that email with that code. So then uh, that mail will deliver to your whitelist or deliver to your email box. So there are some tools available like that. So that somehow protect that, but it's kind of difficult. Uh, it's not convenient for the sender. So in addition to that, there are several other techniques like integrity checking. That means actually we check the uh, hash of the, uh, hash of these emails with non spam hashes. And then there are methods that we call reverse DNS lookups. So, to check, we run the reverse DNS to check whether these uh, email addresses or the DNS names are still act, uh, real names, or because spammers usually use bogus names, which is not in the DNS system. Uh, so, then we, most of the times, online mail servers use rule based filtering. 
school based uh, training or kind of uh, AI techniques, right? actually, deep learning techniques nowadays. And uh, deep learning, using those deep learning techniques, they, uh, they have kind of uh, learned uh, the stands and they can assign the standing score to your incoming mail. So, the most of the popular email providers, what they do, they have trained their systems uh, to give a standing score. So, this standing score higher than that, some value. They automatically put that mail into your spam folder. So uh, when you check your spam folders on online email systems, you know there are thousands of spams there. You never check it usually. So those uh, spam people, the service providers put your mail to the spam folders nowadays mainly based on the AI technique. So those uh, rules and the techniques are kind of like. Nine, over 90 percent accurate so most of the mails goes they are usually no spam but spammers still manage to escape from those so that's why you are still getting spam like advertisement phishing mails and so on that means they are still not full proof so for example my go fish example also my i send a fish to my gmail and it's delivered to my inbox not to the spam folder that means gmail did not detect that spam uh, or the type of spam, fishing, fishing spam, like that. So, so that is how we could stop spam. And finally, what I would like to discuss is a uh, few email best practices there, but I like to highlight the field called blind carbon copy field. So if you, some people are still not aware of that. When you compose the email message, you know, there are three fields you can type the email address. That is the, uh, recipient, CC field, and BCC field. So you use recipient fields to put your recipients, and CC fields to put the carbon copy addresses of the recipient. So there is a field called BCC field. Using BCC field, you can put send this mail to other people as well. So what is the difference between CC and BCC? So when you put the email addresses on the CC field, Everybody receive this email knows to whom that email copied. So if you put your email addresses in the BCC field, so no one will see each other's email address. So why is it important? It is important because so you uh, you are not exposing your email contact to the other people using BCC. If you use CC, you are automatically exposing all of your recipients or all of your email contacts to the other people. So then what happened? So the, what happened here that, so for example, let's say one of these recipients you expose infected with the malware, right? So then what that malware might do, they might take all your recipient addresses in, from the CCC field and use that addresses to spam the malware itself, right? Then it means by using CCC field, you put yourself and all your email contact on trouble because we, you, we never know one of that your contact might infect it with some malware. So then, so it's really dangerous. In addition to that, some of these uh, harvesting programs might take or may uh, some of this person might tell your contact list to the other people like that. So if you really, really want to show, you write this mail to this list of people, then you put that list in the CCC field. Most of the situation, we don't want to do so. We just want to send a message to a group of people, or we just want to send an invitation to the group of people. There, we don't need to put CC. We can put all email addresses to the BCC. Then no one will see each other's email. So then we will protect each other, ourselves. So otherwise, what happens? Uh, so we are putting ourselves and all our friends in our contact list on Trump. So that is kind of a best email practice uh, which we need to follow. But most of the people, Still, I see they are not following it. So, 
So keep remember not to use CCC, uh, not to use CC unless you really need them. Okay, so as you, we are now reaching to the end of this lecture today, where we thoroughly discussed the email security. So in this lecture, in the first part of this lecture, I discussed the two international standards, what we call it as SMIME and PGP, and show you how we practically use this standards or the protocols uh, to secure our email communication. I show you practical example where how we can enhance our Gmail communication using PGP plugin. So if you do so, these emails are provide confidentiality, integrity, authenticity, and non-repetition, unless otherwise. So you are using kind of postcard treatment pencils to take your decision. So nowadays, I, I know most of you are working at home, you take crucial decisions based on the emails you receive, so, so you have to trust those mails. So, so if whatever the mail you receive by these regular systems cannot trust. They are postcards written in person. So you have to take action to enhance the security on those mails before you use them to take crucial action. So the simple way of doing it without any cost is add PGP plugin, create public private key for yourself and exchange your public keys between your group of people and use PGP sign message, at least PGP sign message uh, to do the communication. So then with that you will get digitally signed emails. Digital signatures are legally valid even in Sri Lanka. So there you don't need to take physical signatures on the documents like financial documents and so on. So if you digitally sign the decision, so that is legally valid. You can take whatever actions based on that. So unless otherwise, so, so you cannot trust those email communication. So that is the main discussion which we did in the first part of the lecture. The second part of the lecture, we discussed the problems with spam. So we, I demonstrated how usually spammers collect the email addresses. Then I demonstrated how people running spam campaigns or how do they do phishing. So because of that, those, those tools are open source tools really available. So because of that, anyone can do those attacks. So as a email users, we need to be careful on those. So we need to be able to identify phishing attacks. So we should not look at just pictures, visual look of the page. Instead, we have to carefully look on the URL or the domain name, whether this domain is trusted domain certified by the correct certification or so before you type your usernames and the password. Otherwise, at, if you, without notice those, you type your credential accidentally to use the phishing mail, so then you expose your passwords to the phishing. So then I discussed uh, like uh, uh, in order to kind of uh, uh, protect the phishing, the simple thing what you should do is don't click the link. So but people, even though we educate people, people still do so. So that's why still people do phishing. Uh, then the other, at uh, the final, uh, uh, clients, which I mentioned to you, when you write the mails to the group of people, don't uh, use CC, unless otherwise you really want to do so, uh, just use uh, BCCC to send the mails to the group of people. So with that, uh, I would like to conclude the lecture. Uh, we thoroughly discussed the security of email system. Uh, I think uh, still kind of uh, have, uh, kind of over 50 participants are listening to me. Uh, so may you might have some questions uh, in the chat. I saw there are some questions typed in. Uh, let me see those chat uh, and then see whether I can answer some of the questions. There is a question from asking on. Uh, can we use the chat for, oh yes, we can actually, I said yes. Uh, yes. So, if
if you have questions, you can raise on the chat. I am now go through these questions, which tied on the chat. Uh, so I will then explain, read the question and explain to the audience. Uh, so will this uh, will this work on the email science? So there is a Siri this is question. So maybe you're asking about the PGP, I guess. Uh, if you want to uh, use the kind of uh, offline email clients, so you can use SMIME because SMIME is usually supported by most of the uh, uh, offline email clients. Uh, so if you are using any online mail service provider like Gmail and Yahoo, you can use PGP. PGP plugin works with any uh, online email clients, so any, any email domain. So for example, if you take, like for example, UCSC is uh, using Gmail as the service provider, so we have UCSC domain, uh, so that's, uh, we can use PGP with that, no, no, no issue. So if our, your email provider is Gmail online, uh, Google or Yahoo, so then this plugin works. So it works with work emails as well, not only the public mail, this works with the work email as well. no, no issue with that. You can use that with work email. And then there is a question. We have assignment to be completed with a pretty possible email extension. Okay, I will consider that. So one student asked to extension to my previous assignment, CSO. Actually, I didn't uh, do a lecture on that, but I have uploaded two uh, video lectures where you uh, follow that and then you can do that uh, CSO activity, I guess, after that. Uh, if you need any extensions, okay, I will, I will extend that. Uh, uh, and uh, if you have any questions, you can type on the chat window. Uh, so it's convenient, you see. Uh, so uh, so I can read the questions for the audience and then answer that question. Uh, any, any questions? I think still over 50 people are uh, uh, listening to me. Uh, so if people start chatting, so any questions? So before I start the session, if you have any questions, I would like to ask. Uh, there's a question uh, from Handika. It says, is there any limitation for PGP? So, uh, so there are no limitations. Uh, so I don't, uh, uh, so which kind of limitations you are talking about, uh, if you can, Clarify that would be easy for me in terms of length. No, uh, the terms of length actually, the, the uh, as you may see this, uh, in the terms of length, uh, this uh, mail analog clients only provide two key sizes, that is uh, 2048 and 4096. So 4096 keys are more than enough nowadays. Usual recommended uh, RSA key length is 2048. So, so that is the limitation with the key size with the PGP. Uh, so if you use any, or there are offline PGP clients as well, terminal commands called GPG. So you can use GPG also to do the same. So I demonstrated this online version because it's practical. Nowadays, you, since you work at home, uh, you can use those, configure it and use it uh, to communicate within your people who use your organization email as well, so that uh, you feel safe. Any questions? So if you have questions, you can type it, uh, or you can unmute your mic and ask even. Uh, okay, in addition to that, uh, so you can drop me an email uh, on, uh, with, uh, with some feedback uh, of the lecture I did today because it's real, I really need that to uh, deliver the rest of the lecture. So, so any improvements you want to see from my side uh, and any suggestions uh, on this delivery mode and any other issues uh, you face and like I, I faced actually power issue at the beginning. Fortunately, I survived. Uh, 
so like that uh, so let me uh, 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 know those if you uh, have any feedback uh, kindly let me know so I can uh, address those and there is a question asking uh, will these lectures will be uploaded to the page really? of, of course yes uh, so I am recording this lecture entire lecture so uh, I will upload uh, during the day uh, to the PG, PG really, so you can listen the recorded lecture so if you want to share with that uh, to anyone else even you are welcome you can share those lectures because usually I put it into uh, YouTube uh, to kind of uh, so YouTube basically optimize the uh, length of those videos and then uh, kind of uh, quality so then you can use less bandwidth to so what I do, I after record, I upload to the YouTube and then uh, link that to the PGV. So then you can get optimized uh, video. Uh, then there's a message. Uh, thank you for using such online mode to lecture in one such situation. Will other lecturers also do the same? Uh, most probably, yes. Uh, so I did to initiate that. I did this lecture to initiate how it goes and how, how many people will participate and to get those feedbacks. So if you can give feedback, uh, that is great. Uh, so there is other message saying great effects uh, and thanks. A lot of thank you, sir, uh, for doing this. Uh, thank you very much. So you are very welcome. So we are here to kind of support you the learning. Uh, so, so we try all our best to deliver that. So, so I did it to kind of uh, see whether it works. Uh, so I feel it works, and I did two hour lecture. Plus, I am getting real feedback, saying thank you and uh, thank you very much, and a great effect, and so so many feedbacks I'm getting with the chat window. Thank you very much for students. So that uh, uh, feel me, and I think feel the other lecturers. Uh, also comfortable of delivering that. So some of the other UC lecturers also listening that uh, following this session to see whether it properly works. They might realize it, it works at least to some extent. Uh, uh, so since all of you are stay at home, uh, so so we kindly keep safe. Uh, so I got a lot of uh, messages from students, uh, maybe 10, 15, uh, saying thank you. Uh, so that means uh, all the students are following that throughout the two hours. And I feel they all of them are uh, kind of uh, enjoying it. So a lot of messages and up, uh, appreciating this effort. Uh, so with this, uh, I believe all the other lecturers at the university will do the same in a couple of weeks. So then you can continue your MSA program uh, without any delay. So that's what we try to do. Because I know all of you are people who work in the industry who want to get this master as soon as possible. Uh, there are several questions. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate We are able to follow the practical sessions along with you. Like some people already follow the practical sessions along with me. That's very nice feedback because when I do it in the lecture, I only demonstrate and you don't get uh, get a chance to follow it because I don't, uh, you don't use your computers in the class. But when I do it in this mode, you are at the computer, you can do the same together with me. So then uh, you can follow it. So like it's, uh, like a lab, practical lab we do together. Uh, so like we get advantage of this side mode. And the other advantage is I uh, record those lectures and then some uh, in the face-to-face uh, -face lectures, I saw some people recording it using their phones. But when I do it this mode, basically, I, I record it and with you, so you don't need to record, but uh, you may listen to that entire lecture later on that way. Okay, so uh, I think we can wrap it up. So we run over two hours, uh, wrap it up for today. Uh, there's a last question. Uh, we are also able to do a Google of the thumbs terms you in the picture and get better. Yes, 
That's correct. So when I doing that, uh, you, since you had the computer, you can Google it, and if you don't understand that, you can try it yourself, and then try to understand and so on. I think more interactive. So doing this online lecture is more interactive. So only issue is with me basically, since I talk to the screen, uh, not to the people. I don't get eye contact. Usually lecturers uh, really appreciate doing the lectures with getting eye contact. They are getting. Then the lecturers get a feeling whether the student gets. Uh, understand the lecture or not. Uh, so since the audience is not live, so I am kind of uh, uh, talking to the screen. So that is kind of an uh, issue for me in the lecturing side. But it's, uh, so when we do continuously do so, if you can have such live chat, and if you can continuously give in the feedback during the lecture as well, then basically we can improve the interaction. So then I understood which things you uh, need to improve and so on. Right. Uh, thank you very much for everybody. Uh, definitely I do the same session during the next week as well. Uh, and maybe next Saturday or maybe in the, uh, curfew is enforced. I think everybody at home. Uh, so we can do another session by maybe uh, even Tuesday if you are okay. So I will drop you an email. So even you cannot join online sessions, you can listen the videos. So that's also fine. Uh, so we will discuss with the other lecturers, and then uh, we will publish some formal schedule, maybe to the LMS, uh, saying these uh, lecturers will do online lectures on those days, uh, kind of uh, ahead of time. So then uh, you can be following online lectures uh, right so definitely i will deliver the rest of my lectures uh, before the new year and finish this course before the new year celebration uh, even though you know cities are closed so i have to do uh, the next lecture i will discuss about the cryptocurrencies and bitcoin electronic uh, uh, payment system i have to do two lectures on that i will start it in next lecture schedule to do on electronic payment so with that, uh, I would like to say thank you uh, for uh, listening to me for two hours in this morning today. Uh, so take care of yourself and then stay at home. So let's 